aside from this, uh, I got Trine 4, and which is, looks really nice and smooth, but yeah. Zombieland Double Tap. Mm -hmm. um, I've only looked at the options menu, mm -hmm. and I think I've already seen too much. Um, it's it, bear in mind it's thirty. Oh, the film tie-in. Well, it can't be bad. The, well, the, the last film tie-in game I played was the Expender Bros, which was that free expansion to Broforce. Yeah, which is one of the best games I've made. Because Broforce is one of the best yeah. games I've made, and uh, and it makes perfect sense. And that was fun. It was like it's like an hour long, isn't it? A load of extra levels with the characters, which is fine, but. Bear in mind that this is a full £35 game. When I turned it on, um, I just... Where did I put my vape? Oh, it's there. Uh, when, I, when I put the game on, it was, in, it was like people doing impressions of like Jesse Eisenberg. It's not the voices. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems really cheap. Like the, the introduction thing. May, maybe you'll understand it more than I did, but it shows like the world, the ruined world rotating. Yeah. And they have a bit of dialogue that's like really forced... And do you know when you can almost, when there's dialogue in video games and you can hear one line stop and the other one start, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's really kind of choppy and they say yeah. things that don't that don't quite make sense. And all I did was go to the character selection screen, obviously I left the Woody Harrelson, and I just thought, this reminds me of, what was that game called on the PS2? <laughs> uh, there were probably quite a few on the PS2. It, it was like Hunter Wayward the Reckoning. Oh yeah, yeah. Did you play that quite a bit? Maybe <laughs> because it was a four-player local cop game on yeah. the PS2, which is rare. So yeah, I, I'll hold, I'll reserve judgment, but I did think <sighs> thirty-five quid <sighs> for yeah, a film tie That's pretty steep, and yeah. it seems uh, in Zombieland as well. I don't know. The whole thing just seems a bit late in the day, doesn't it? Because when did the first Zombieland came out? When ten years ago? It must be. I wouldn't say ten. I would say like two thousand and nine, wasn't it? it? Must have been around that time. I mean, I could find out. Yeah, you are holding a phone. Oh, oh, well, I, yeah. While he's doing that, obviously, uh, birthday present off Rupert. Good, good, good. Candle market. I'd, I'd give a shout out to the guy, but I can't remember his name. French guy. Oh, French. Yeah. Good. Um, good. I don't. Good. Uh, yeah. I, th I think the last film tie-in I played was maybe... Goldmine. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, was probably Scott Pilgrim. That was. Probably that was alright. Wasn't that weirdly one player? Uh, I played it one player. I don't know whether. I'd be surprised if it was. Surely it can't have been one player. Mm -hmm. You'd yeah, think I mean, that about the remake of Shaq Fu, but that was uh, one player <laughs> as well, wasn't it? Right. <laughs> that game had morally bankrupt humour. <laughs> like all the best. All the best games. games. Questionable morals. Right, Zombieland. I'm going to say 2010 or 11. 2009. 10 years. Yeah, but there's a sequel coming out, so it's like Zombieland Double Tap, the game of the sequel. Yeah, yeah, obviously, but I, uh, it's really the whole, the whole thing. Like, y you know, when like Anchorman Two came out, or yeah. and it wasn't or very even good. What, Zoolander Two, and it's like it's and it wasn't very good. Yeah, <laughs> hang on, there's a theme. Here. <laughs> the, it's like they wait so long for these sequels, and it's like it's the not passed. it's not quite long enough to be nostalgic. Um, and yet it's too long for anyone to really care. I just don't know. I don't know where the audience is for that. But maybe I'll be wrong. I struggle to believe that you're the head of Universal sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I was head of Universal, then I would be saying, it's been too long. <laughs> it's been too long, but not long enough for nostalgia. <laughs> but it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite apt, but, actually, because we will be discussing nostalgia later. So. Yes. In fact, have you got your notes? Yours? Uh, I've got my notes on my electronic device. Saving the world one tree at a time. My Moto G. <laughs> <laughs> have you got your Philips on a clip? <laughs> <laughs> on a, like a leather pouch on your belt? Yeah, with a spare battery pack as well. <laughs> Driller killer. When he's looking at that advert for the thing he uses to go and killing everyone, and I mean, it's like, oh, it comes with a load of... And there's about 40 so double Because they're like... Double oh, I might just use a screwdriver instead. <laughs> I might just stab him, yeah, just with a knife or something. Um, so I've added a few late entries for me because I had a few to review over the last week. Oh. Um, so I've got Val Faris. Um, every time I say that, I feel like I'm putting on a Romanian accent and saying Rolf Harris. <laughs> so I've got Val Faris. Um, Val Faris, see? Yeah, I see it. Yeah. That was good, that was. I'm available, Bram, by the way. <laughs> um, nobody's, yeah. sorry, go on. You are the natural successor to Bella Lugosi. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so Valtharis is nobody's. Uh, Eterno Blade 2. I'm not even... A Eterno Blade. A Eterno Blade. A-E-T-E-R-N-O. A Eterno Blade 2. Little Town Hero. And Rupert's got New Revoider, which I've never heard about. Time Spinner, which I'm excited to hear your thoughts on. Bastion. Starlink Battle for Atlas Deluxe Edition. And then in brackets, you've got This Edition is Relevant. So I'm intrigued about that. Uh, Link's Awakening, which we've now finished. And this is then trans transition into a discussion about playing classic games for the first time. So that's quite a good one. Yeah, it's quite a packed show. All right, cheers, guys. See you later. <laughs> yeah, that's the promo done. So, go on, then I'll, I'll go first. So, with I had Valfaris to play, and it's a really chunky... Well, Paris. <laughs> Why are you putting in a Romanian action? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's like a really chunky pixel art game. Uh, it's, I've seen it described as a Metroidvania, but it's not really. It's more of a straight sort of action platformer. Okay. Really, really shoot uh, gun heavy. And... I was thinking as I was, the music is awesome. It's a band called Celtic Frost, who I've heard of. But in, what's key about it is that the soundtrack is like chugging doom metal, mm. but almost stripped down to its most like basic fundamentals. So it's yeah. not, it's not this really it's not complex more of a sound kind of. Thing. Yeah, it's not like no, 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 constantly. It's just like doo dum dum. So okay. You kind of like yes, and there's no lyrics, which is key because every time any video game has lyrics, oh my god, even songs I like, I look at you flat out too. You just think I've got to mute this. I can't keep listening to the same. When it's not, when mm. it's looped and it's just instrumental, it's yes. not so bad. Oh, that's fine. The end of Hellblade, uh, Senua's Sacrifice, which is one of my favourite ever games. I still haven't played it. It's unbelievable. Amazing game, but it's got a song at the end with like lyrics, like the worst lyrics I've ever heard for of anything, and, it's, <laughs> and it it almost ruins the experience. Not quite. The actual Bloody music's hell. okay, but my god, the lyrics, it's just like, just don't do that. So, so many, um, so many like RPGs, Japanese RPGs at the end, they'll have a song, it's like a woman in a really angelic voice singing, oh, the feathers from heaven lay, lay, fell on our tears, and you think, oh my god, please, please stop this, it's ruined the last 90 hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't I enjoy those. I haven't got a new game plus yet. <laughs> um, see, so it's, you play a guy called, I think his name's Terrian, and... Um, it's just typical gothic, uh, big sort of, kind of like Space Crusade Warhammer 40k sort of vibe with the armour he's got like big pointy and he is obviously a miserable man with long black hair who's landed on this home planet to murder his father for reasons unknown at the start. Mm -hmm. It's got the best landing sequence I've ever seen in a game. Um, one of the first lines in the game is like, the, he's like flying to the planet mm -hmm. in the intro scene and the, the artificial intelligence that kind of guides you throughout the game and acts as a narrator and stuff. Says, um, <clears throat> what did she say? She says, oh, you need to wake up. We're approaching the planet. And his response is, I can't sleep, not even in the void. Bloody hell. And he is not Richard of Horse. So, <laughs> and then he just like lands. There's like a load of enemies and he just crash lands the shit really roughly all over them and crushes them and then jumps out and starts kicking ass. So with the, with the music as well, just booming along background, it's just, it's really tasty. The checkpoints are really quick. Mm. So it's like, you're only like, you won't ever go back a few minutes if you die. Yeah. And it's it's all about nice pacing, big boss battles, really chunky weaponry. Yeah, it's just a really cool, solid 2D game. So if you get defeated by a boss, you don't have to go back and spend 20 minutes getting back to where you were or anything And like that. even better, if you get killed by a boss, when you go, you say you start on the next screen. Because yeah. it's, like it's like scrolls when there's the occasional yeah. transition. Your checkpoint, you go to them, it even cuts out the initial dialogue. It's so so it just goes straight it's back into It's important detail. Yeah, it's so when that happens. Why would you want to see the same? Is that camera wonky? It doesn't matter. We're too far in now. It's just, it kind of, it kind of suitable for our kind of zany. What is it called? Dutch corners or something? Dutch, Dutch angles. Dutch angles. Yeah. The he was a wrestler, wasn't he? Wow. Well, Kurt Angle? Yeah. Although Thanks. I was thinking of Psycho Sid Justice, obviously. Uh, the film Battlefield Earth, is that what it's called? Do you know the one, the Scientology one that was famous in the John Travolta. With John Travolta and yeah. um, Forrest Whitaker. Yeah, because I mix up Battlefield Earth and Battlefield Galactica. Battlestar Galactica. Battlestar Galactica. Very different. But is that the one with James, well, he rips the flag? Yeah. yeah. That's yes. one with James Old Jones and James Ramar. Good. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Battlefield Earth, um, which is not anywhere near the worst film ever made, by the way. I mean, the Scientology stuff is nonsense, but Grand it's no worse stuff. than any number of, like, 80s fantasy sci-fi films, basically. Um, but that, I'm not joking, every single shot in that movie is on a Dutch angle. It's ridiculous. Every single shot is just... On the wonk. On the wonk. And it's like, <laughs> why? Why? 
Why do, it's not, you don't need that. Like, it's just distracting. <laughs> this is Battlefield Earth, every shot is on the wrong. I think pretty much every shot. I yeah. think I'd like to watch that film. It's quite I, enjoyable. I enjoy watching these films of people really, really bang on saying they're really bad and the worst of all time because yeah. some of the stuff we've seen oh yeah Legend Boggy Creek 2 some of the stuff I get sent on these screeners like yeah these low budget things like Israeli <laughs> so what? Films. it's just they're so like low budget and I mean I know that money shouldn't really make the difference but they're, I mean they're so overreaching yeah you know? when someone asks the producer what the budget is and he opens his wallet <laughs> yeah, no, he says, it's uh, <laughs> four pound eighty six. Fifteen quid. Yeah. I think that's an old fiver actually. Let me put a match to it and see what happens. So yeah, really nice um if you if you're into uh, arcadey um shooting modes, because the weapons are really satisfying as well. You start off with just like a blaster and you've got a plasma sword and it's eight way kind of contra combat. You've got a when you it's quite cool actually, when you press I always want to say L two. L Z L on the yeah, switch. Let's just call it L two. L two. Um, when you press L two, you you kind of have a shield that comes out again, so you can like reflect projectiles. Yeah. But it only lasts a certain amount, mm. so it's kind of a little bit tactical, and that locks you in place then, which gives you the eight way combat. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> really, really fun. I played it thinking, I've never heard of this. I'll give it a goosey, but it was really good. I'm, I'm yeah. playing it at the moment, and I'm it's quite addictive. Yeah, I was intrigued by it because it. It had a bit of a presence on the eShop, which can't be said from a lot of games, and um, and it was slightly higher price, I think. So I think it was yeah. like 25, 30 quid or something yeah. like that. So I thought, mm, is that overpriced or is that is this just a good high production value game? A lot, a lot of the you can tell a lot of um, the, a lot of money goes in, has gone into the sort of environmental and yeah. sound design because the environments are kind of really um, flashy, sort of technophobia kind of yeah. uh, living levels which are cool but all well, the other thing is the platforming can between the foreground and the background get a bit confusing when it gets busy sometimes the parallax <laughs> all the old parallax uh, uh, how far through it are you do you know I think I'm about two two and a half hours in right and it's not I as long like it's ending anytime. I would guess it's been it's not going to be longer than like six six hours I wouldn't have thought it's perfect yeah which Thanks. is fine it's a good question about price of games actually it could be a future topic because it's the one thing I never comment on because I always think oh well people People in different amounts of money, they have different budgets, they might, I don't know if they're... Yeah, at the end of the day, if it's a good game, it's a good game. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, like, well, we probably shouldn't get into it now. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> there are, yeah, there are yeah. certain <laughs> games where I think, well, that was a good experience, but I'm never, never going to play it again. So it's like, mm, is that worth it? Not yeah, sure. good next time. Um, so, yeah, that was Valfire, it's really good. Nobody's was a game I got sent by an Argentinian company because it was a guy called, I think his name's like August... Augustus Rhodes or Augustinian Rhodes who did scratches on the PC right. and I happen to be he mentioned this like another because he's Argentinian he mentioned another company there and they released this game called Nobody's and I was like I'll have a crack at that and it was really good I played it in my brother's house and it's it's very casual it leans it, you play someone who is a cleaner for the government as in cleans up crime scenes and gets rid of bodies but it's all very static it plays more like a hidden object game than um a full-fledged adventure, graphic adventure. So it's not like serial cleaner. I've never played that. That's, well, that's like the first person thing where you're cleaning up after. Oh, like a first like, FPS, yeah, Fallen yeah. Twins. Oh no, this is very much like a you know the, the, you'll go like the first one is on the top of a kind of construction site and it's very static, mm. and you you know you've got to um, for instance the version you've got to get all the parts together from the scene, put the guy you end up putting him in like a, a you know a pillar and cementing it over and then you've got to put uh, everything no. back as it was and leave. And then you get marked on like you know, when the police turn up, it comes up on just the text, just saying, "Okay, you didn't do this, you didn't put this back, you didn't correct this." So they spotted this. Cool it is good and it's really fun because sometimes there's bit one level in a hotel because they're all in quite different places, like a museum and stuff. The museum ones especially good, but um, you walk it along. And my brother was like, "Don't forget, you can't just walk in the hotel because you, you're carrying a dead body." <laughs> and if you get caught, the, it just the sirens play and it says, "You got caught. You're carrying a dead body around the lobby of a hotel." And then it kind of resets. It's usually a bit of a red flag. So yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm guys. I'm not a detective. <laughs> but And it kind of resets to like a few screens back so you can right. do it again. And it was really fun. It was a really simple kind of casual game. Like I said, it's very much for fans of hidden object games, which I do, do enjoy. Mm. Um, but then it, it does this the thing that most games of that ilk do in the later game stages where you get to the point where you're just trying everything with everything else. Yeah. The, the, the more... Um, 
complicated the level gets, yeah. the more the more it's not so much about like oh, doing something cool. It's like I've got to get this to cut that to get in there to, and it, and it just becomes like um, it, it's obviously become... what it needs to do, like a chain of events, and yeah. that for me is when that kind of snappiness leaves it a bit. Yeah. Um, they're not just like small contained clever levels. It's a bit expansive, and you think oh, I'm kind of, I'm just doing that thing in my inventory now. Where it's like well you know what what am I doing here? Uh, so it's good. And if you like that style of game where you just like, some people like to get stuck on these games, don't they? Do you know what I mean? They like to spend, mm. I, I don't, I like a punchy. So it's good, but the last, I think there's only 10 or 12 stages in it. The last like two or three were a bit, okay, I'm kind of a little bit tired of this now. Yeah. Um, Eternal Blade 2 was uh, at like a 2.5D hack and slash game, which really good fun. But <laughs> it, it was, it was good. It reminded me a little bit. The first game I played like this was Shadow Complex. One I really liked that, where yeah. it was just you know Metroidvania sort of. This isn't so much a Metroidvania; it's much more of a. Uh, it, it reminded me of a game called Evil Genome on the PC, where the, it, you know the the voice acting's bad, um, the the visuals are like quite dated. They've got the plastic hair, you know the yeah, plastic, and like Lego hair. Yeah, <laughs> and the story is just completely preposterous, and it just assumes you've played the first game. It just introduces characters and this, these terminologies. I'm like, I don't know what's happening. But it's cool, the combat's fun, and you unlock weapons, and there's quite a, a, a nice skill tree, and then you flip between different characters who play slightly differently with different melee attacks. Is it grindy? No, no, okay. it's, it's, all, it's all about pro sort of solid progress. Okay. Um, but three and a half hours into the game, mine came to a dead stop, because it, I, it gets to a cutscene, the cutscene finishes, and my character would not move. And I, I, I thought it was my controller, or it would just glitched, but I've uninstalled it, reinstalled it, and I cannot get past that part. So I'm assuming... It's a game-breaking bug. It's a game-breaking bug that has an effect. So whilst the game is kind of... Um, and that's on Switch. Yes, on Switch. So it's while it's kind of a trashy, fun, mindless kind of 2.5D um, hack-and-slash game, at the moment it's just unplayable after three hours. Awesome. And I really... I think I was like 8% into the game. And I'm guessing that... It's one of those games where you, you have one save slot, sort of thing. Yeah, otherwise yeah, you so just have to start again. Yeah, that sucks. I'm so, looking at you, Dark so I just do. Yeah, God. <laughs> um, Burger Time Party, just a quick one. That was. It's ba I thought it was made by Data East. Data East, I thought it was just... Because it plays so much just like a remastering of the original Burger Time, which is yeah. a cool game. But it's got... Even the music is sort of similar. But what I found was it's just... it's If you imagine Burger Time ramped up for a modern audience and just made four players good so it's a really good party game there's not much to say beyond the fact that it's, it's basically burger time um so yeah that, that was cool a um, good party game little town hero was a bit of a disappointment i yeah i've had some very middling reviews yeah it, it's i've never played any of the pokemon games apart from the ones on the original on the game Boy color Jesus. which i really liked but that was a long time ago um and this had some really weird problems. When I read about it on paper, and it's, you know, you're a kid in a town, and they never leave the town. Yeah. No one knows what's beyond it, and you want to get out of it. It could be... It reminded me of Attack on Titan, that kind of, oh, you know, what's going on then? Mm. But that mystery just doesn't exist in the game. It's almost like no one really cares. They're just in this town, and yeah. the occasional monsters start coming, and it's quite uninteresting. And it suffers from real technical problems. It never feels smooth. No. And there are certain points, whenever you turn the camera around and it's, you know, there's like an expanse in front of you, yeah. it really, it That's really weird. feels like it's juddering. It sounds very unoptimized. And the um, the camera is, is locked at a weird angle. You can, you can tilt it like slightly, but it... Sorry, I've got a cat. I thought she would just meow a bit. I don't know what she's doing. Um, she's probably just trying to find my hands again to slash <laughs> them, them off. Um, but it, it never feels free. You're walking yeah. around this like pretty locked-in town. It's just got like a main street, and you've got mm. the castle and the little village and a farm. But the key draw about it is the thing that kind of put me off. So, the, the on the on the description of the game, it's uh, game freaks say um, this is designed with the the busy gamer in mind. So it's not really grindy. But what it does have are battles that take well beyond 30 minutes. Really? So you honestly... Oh, for a single battle? For a single battle. It's really in-depth. So you've got these things called... When you get to a battle, with a, there's not that many battles in it, really, in total. So you, you mix up, you meet up, and there's a monster and there's you, and you've got these things called is-its, and you've got a certain amount of points. And they kind of thoughts. They appear as like five or six thoughts of things you can do. So you click on an is-it, and it turns into a does-it, sort of like is-it idea, does-it. 
does it, does I suppose. It, yeah. So you do that, and then you've got like a red shield and a blue shield, and you've got these other other kind of. Um, I can definitely hear a cat meowing. Right, you have to come in. You have to be very quiet. Yeah, which you won't do. Um, so you, yeah, it's these is it's and dads it's and you've got all these kind so of it's 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 these environment <laughs> these environmental sort of things, and also every round you you move on a sort of a set track. There's like a, a map, an over map, and you press. Um, you kind of roll a dice, and yeah. then you move a certain amount. And on, on each of these, then there's other environmental things which can help or hinder you. And but to use them, you have to have the right does it. And it's very complicated. And the battles go on and on and on. And one of them took me about forty minutes. And I thought, oh my god, there's the thing is, I'm doing all these. The battle here is the draw because I'm not. I'm finding that a grind. Yeah, the key, the core. Uh, and I'm not through. interested in the story. I'm thinking, even when I get through this. I'm back to like a relatively uninteresting, pretty generic story, mm. and with the the kind of um, stuttering and sometimes the music, which is by Toby Fox, who did Undertale, yes. um, th that sometimes was stuttering, and I just thought this just doesn't feel like finished. it's finished. Yeah. yeah. So, what is the purpose? What's the overall purpose though? Like, you just get more and more like. Stop it. <laughs> do you just get more and more aggressive? bigger creatures coming at you i mean is, yeah he's building up the town or anything no no the, the town is just the, the kind of you know it's just got a load of people in it that you sort of you interact with and there are subquests and the subquests it, the, the idea for the subquest is quite cool but it's just not used well so like the, for instance really early in the game there's a, a quest where you've got to go to your mine where you work and you use like a pickaxe to attack people mm. and that's another thing is all the all the all the attacks you've got have all these different funky names and different powers but they all use the same two or three animations. So the battles are 40 minutes long, and there's not really much, they're just pretty repetitious, so you, mm. I don't know. Um, but there's, you're going to a mine, and the guy says, you can't come into the mine unless you learn the three tenets, you know, the things you, three things yeah. you say before you enter. So you have to go around the, this small area and talk to everyone, it's like, you have to say hello, you have to work hard, and then I think it's like, take it easy, whatever, and you have to say them in the right order. So going up to people, learning things, and then, and then piecing them into the right sentence is like an interesting little idea. But of course, it's used a lot. Yeah. So, you know, someone says, we need to distract the guard, and you have, you're you like, okay, just, just tell them to go away or something. And then you, you have to spend like 15 minutes talking to everyone, and a lot of the character models are really used. Specific yes, thing. to, to, to oh. say. So it, nothing about it grabbed me. And the combat is clearly the main draw of it, and it, it was just... It felt like a grind. Yeah. Well, yeah. Some so people will love out, it. They've taken out the grind of like, uh, like multiple the battles, battles. Yeah. And but, put them in one big one. Yes. Yeah, so they've just put the grind into single battles. Mm. That doesn't. Yeah. That's yeah. not really taken out the grind. That's just displacing the grind. Yeah. <laughs> displacing the grind. So, not 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 for me at all, really. Yeah. Um, and and that's it actually for me. So it's on to you, my my sweet. <laughs> um, right. Let's take this small piece of paper. Neuro, neuro voider. I can't remember why I picked that. Must have I like how you see you brought your electronic notes and then you take my old fashioned bit of paper. Just <laughs> <laughs> like the old days, eh? Um, neuro voider is a twin stick shooter. Good. Good. Um, which is uh, obviously like kind of top down type thing. And it is. Uh, it's got a roguelite, I guess, so... Careful now. Well, yeah, it, it's, it, it's good fun. It's quite limited in terms of, like, basically you just go through a series of levels and they get harder and harder. It's single player. Uh, multiplayer. So up to four, I think. I'm Maybe. not sure how the f uh, multiplayer would work, exactly. Is it similar to Neon Chrome at all, or is it...? Yeah, kind of similar. Yeah, it's a bit more kind of cartoony than that. Um, it's got really nice pixel art graphics. Um, yeah. And it's got like it's got like loads of good weapons, and you can upgrade your kind of bot thing. Yeah. You're floating around. Yeah, like a drone sort of thing. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's got good upgrades between the levels. Um, you c it's a lot of loot, but you can just like flog it or turn oh, it into. Oh, it's just not just. Yeah, so it's like it's not constant, and that's all between the levels. So it's not like halfway through a level you're just pausing it to and then like, switch out. Your menu freezes. It's just like between the levels, you like. You can upgrade, sell stuff, do whatever, scrap stuff, nice. all that kind of stuff. So, um, so it seems pretty streamlined. Pretty it is, and <sighs> almost to a fault because it's like nothing really changes that much. The boss is <clears throat> challenging. I think as far as I've got is the 
third boss because it's like four sections I think so section one boss section two boss section three boss that's where I got to so oh, I haven't right. got to it's challenging would it be like. easier with more people probably yeah mm. yeah it feels good like um, I mean this it's one of those ones where it's procedural generation but really just kind of shifting bits around it like it's oh, there's quite, like set like kind of like moonlight yeah, it's, it's not set. it's not really meant to be any kind of like a realistic facility it's just an arena really so it's like a, so but what's quite neat is like before each level uh you'll get a choice of three levels three variations basically oh, no. and they'll have like um they'll have like kind of uh stats on them for how many how much loot there is how big the level is and how many elites there are which so, i guess are the hard yeah so they get and that's where you get the best loot from sort of thing so i tend to go for the smaller ones with more stuff in them because it's just a bit more fun rather than exploring but yeah it's a pretty neat little game yeah if you're exploring and there's no secrets what are you exploring for really i should have brought my switch over so we could play it but you know here we are this is the reality we're living in, isn't it? The thing is, the switch is so heavy to pack up and carry. I don't blame you. I'd have to bring my CRT TV as well. <laughs> um, I played Time Spinner, which I believe you've played before as I well. I really like that, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't say I really liked it. I quite liked it. Well, that's the end of the show. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and this partnership. I just saw it was a little bit... <clears throat> derivative of Castlevania? A little bit, yeah. I just thought it was a little bit generic. I didn't really care about the story or anything. It mm. reminded me a little bit of... I think maybe it's because I've played Iconoclasts. Right. Um, it reminded me a lot of that. Which and I love Icon Iconoclasts. So I thought that was like no, what our boys should have been. Right. Um, but yeah, Iconoclasts is brilliant, and it's and that's got quite an engaging story. Well, now that you've mentioned it, Rupert, obviously. There it is. Well, featured. <laughs> featured game of the week is up there. Yeah. That's a good game as well, but not as good as Iconic Class. <laughs> but not as good I, I as think the reason I like Time Spinner so much was because I was in the zone for that kind of game, yeah. and I hadn't played a Metrovania in a while. Yeah. So it kind of came along at the perfect time. Yeah, I don't think, like, I think I remember asking you about like some of the systems in it because I was so confused by oh, the bit with the, the lasers. Did you get past that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I finished it in the end. Um, was I right? Was it in the library? Yeah, I think so. But what the game didn't seem to explain was the fact that you would you were switching between time zones it kept going on about switching between time zones but it w didn't make it clear how you're doing this but or what effect it had yeah so but once i worked that out it was like okay and i was a little bit worried that like okay he's got these huge sprawling levels and so i'm not only having to explore the in metrovania <laughs> style i'm having to explore go twice. back a thousand years and do it again but it was pr it, yeah the navigation wasn't great and that always annoys me in uh, Metrovania games but I think weirdly when I was playing the game again it was just a stroke of luck that every time I thought I'm stuck yeah oh I'll try there that looks like I haven't got and I was just lucky like I never yeah. I never had to just think I don't know what I'm doing now I think that's what the best Metrovanias do is like they don't they don't hold your hand but they naturally you naturally Have discover a, yeah. like the, what, the way to go you see what I mean? Like, if it's cleverly designed, like, Ori and the Blind Forest is so well you designed. You like that, don't I you? I love that game. <laughs> you do like that. And, um, just out now on Switch. That's only 15 quid as well, good. Um, uh, so, but with that, it's like, okay, it will point you in the direction of where you're meant to be going, but yeah. not how to get there, so you kind of have to work your way, <clears throat> way through. But it's yeah. quite a natural form of exploration. So I thought Time Spinner was quite good, but... The combat never quite landed with me. There was something. It's up... very stiff combat. It's, it's very like horizontal. Combat. Yeah, and it's and it, what I noticed about it was that with every weapon, because you have these kind of orbs yeah. that you, just, even though they're clearly just melee weapons, but um, and but every time you press the button, there's a slight lag between pressing the button and it actually like swiping. Oh, okay. And it seems to be. I thought, okay, is it just this particular? one I'm using but I tried it with every single weapon and they all had that thing so it's a design feature it's really weird so it's not like hit the buttons sla Boom. slash as you're hitting the buttons sort of thing it's like hit the button and they'll start an animation uh, it's like so it's a weird timing thing going on but yeah so it's quite good but better than Bastion which I didn't think was very good no, I, I Bastion really didn't grab me. I found the whole thing just... There's no real connection between them. It's just that was the next game on the list. Oh, right. Sorry. I thought you were yeah, just making the, a comment. No, because that was... Uh, yeah, because that's not a Metrovania at all. It's like a top-down... Isometric sort of thing. Isometric. Uh, 
I don't know, brawler, shooter kind of thing? I can't remember. I played it for about two or three hours and I just thought, I'm not enjoying this and stopped. It's because the combat... Played on the Vita, I think. The combat is really bad in that game. Oh, okay. Like, that is... And that's a real problem because the presentation is so beautiful. I love the fact that there's, like, this Sam Elliott-type voiceover going on, like, this kind of, like, cowboy-sounding voiceover. Good. Um, like, telling the story as you go through it and reacting to what you do. That's cool. The way the graphics are beautiful, the way that the levels kind of rise up from the as ground you're as you're walking them. along, that's cool. But also, the graphics are a little bit busy, so sometimes you just fall off an edge because you can't Yeah, see the, I remember the there's lots of flora and fauna everywhere and stuff. Oh, on the subject of Sam Elliott, by the way, I watched The Man Who Killed Hitler and then Bigfoot, and Sam Elliott is good in a film that isn't. That's mm. my review of that. He has always been the best thing in the films, he's been in, <laughs> including the legacy. 27 years? Yeah, it might be been early. Yeah, probably about that. That was the film that got um, Richard Marquin the um, Empire Strikes Back job. Apparently. Really? Yeah. Can you see why? Not really. I don't really. I mean, it's well made. It's quite polished, and uh, it's quite a cool movie, The Legacy. But was Sam Elliott clean shaven in it, or mm, he's, he's got a big walrus moustache? <laughs> I can't remember. He's got, he might have a moustache. That's where he met his wife, anyway, on that movie. And it's cool because like uh, you. Like they're obviously in a relationship, and it's quite nice that to see two people genuinely in a relationship. In a relationship is quite cool. But yes, anyway, we digress. Yeah, Bastion. Yeah, the, the problem is, is, apart from all the presentation and the production values and stuff, it's just the combat is just bad. It's like it it doesn't has no weight whatsoever, and it's just because it's so busy on the screen. It's like very hard to tell. Is it? I remember. Is it? You use a crossbow or something in that, and isn't it awkward to aim as well? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's all flooded back, all the high points. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I ended up using. I end up. I think I just upgraded my main hammer because you can just mm. spin through enemies, and also I think I used a shotgun because you just blast things from up close, and it had the Diablo three effect towards the end. When, when I was getting bored of it, I just ran past everything. Yeah. Because I was like, well, what, you know, there's no reason for The Diablo that. effect. I yeah. do like that. Yeah. So uh, that wasn't so good. Um, so Starlink Battle for Atlas. Right, this is a totally new one to me, by the way. So this is uh, the deluxe edition. The re the, that is it's relevant. Starlink, they've done with Bioware, so it's some big company. It's Ubisoft. Ubisoft. Yeah, University. so they did, and it's on the Switch, it's obviously got the Star Fox tie-in, which is really well put into the game, actually, because it's like proper... He has a whole storyline of his own. Sort oh, of that's thing. cool. And um, so and it's, Fox he's sort of, cloud or something. Like yeah, that. and he's like he's sort of brought into the, the cutscenes, which are quite well done. Like the production values are brilliant because it's Ubisoft. So they obviously poured money into this game. So it's a uh, it's all set in a kind of you're always in a spaceship and it's set partly in space, but a lot of it's on planets. So there's a bit of No Man's Sky kind of thing in there, but much more simplified. Is it procedurally generated or is it? No, it's all kind of created uh it's but it's only one solar system so i think so there's a few planets and there's stuff to do in space. game set in only one solar system I mean that's nothing but <laughs> um yeah so but the the reason the deluxe edition is relevant is because um the original game was released as a toys to life type of thing where the idea was is that you'd buy because you, you when you bought the physical version of the game you had like this attachment for your control Mm -hmm. where you could buy additional weapons as kind of plastic toys, right. which look kind of cool. Well, you, kind of like Skylanders and stuff like that. Yeah, and you slid them into the device, to, and they change on your ship in real time. Fair enough. Of course, naturally, it's, that sounds cool, but of course it's slightly awkward because you're having to, like, like as it's playing, you're having to, like, pick stuff up and slide it on the right way around and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, It is some gimmicky. It is very gimmicky. And, of course, the problem is, and it's massive, like, just cash cow for them hmm. because you start the game with uh, Ubisoft it's, honing in on a cash cow <laughs> you think it's, it's, you start the game with certain weapons and it's like fine but then of course you get to certain bits in the game where you can unlock secrets and stuff right. but you need certain weapons for it of course the only way you can get to them is by buying them <sighs> and it was such a flawed concept and it just meant that it was just why would I want to do that like I've just paid for this game why would I then want to pay keep paying it's not a mobile game so forget that it's not like it's free up front or anything so it was ridiculous but the deluxe edition just gives you everything um which gives you all of the all of the 
like the downloadable content and stuff. Yeah. Which is which is fine. So it's now the game that it should have been in the first place. I'm with you. And it is a very good game. I mean it's it's kind of Ubisoft like open world, a lot of busy work, but it feels good. It's I mean, when you talk about Little Town Hero. Yeah. Like it, they were saying that that is designed for like kind of the busy gamer. Well, yes. Starlink really is kind of for a busy gamer because you can just um you you can just like you've got so many things to do on each planet like uh you kind of defend a base over here or you'll go and like um attack some pirates over here yeah. and uh and you're kind of cleaning up the planet if you like you're kind of a janitor you feel like you have an impact yeah. on it and, you, and the thing is all of these kind of um, encounters literally last like maybe 30 seconds or a minute okay. sort of thing and then you kind of cleaned up that bit and and with each thing you clean up um you're making allies who will then uh, like mine this kind of uh, element for you, which gets you more money, and then you can upgrade. So, no, so if you, it's a nice progression. Yeah, building. and it's really yeah. nice and smooth. Thirty frames, but smooth. Um, it's good exploration. Looks good. Yeah, and the characters are pretty cool. It's very cartoony, very kind of silly, really. But um, well, like kids' morning show sort of thing. Yeah, a lot like that. And um, yeah, it's just a good game. Just oh, I didn't expect you to say that. With, with, yeah. Especially with the whole, the, with the cash cow Ubisoft thing, and yeah, when it still you, doesn't lots quite of things work. to do. You yeah. Like, okay. like, it still doesn't quite work because it's clearly designed with that in mind, that progression in mind. But so of course now you'll get to a thing and it's like a big secret. But I've got all the weapons now, so I can just uh -huh. open this thing up. So it's not a problem. So when you're the deluxe edition, you get all the bits and pieces, the toys and stuff. Well, I think you get them originally. You would have got them as like because you can get them digitally as well. Right. Okay. See? But um. It's like what? It's like two ninety nine for a weapon pack, and it's like, yeah, I'm not gonna pay that. Sorry. Yes, just to get a secret. I don't think you did very well because that's why it's so cheap now. How like, much did you pay for the deluxe edition? I think it's twenty quid. Wow. Okay. And because um, when it originally came out, there would it was like, I mean, it's like seventy quid or something for <clears> like the, the and that was <clears> the basic set. I don't even think that was a deluxe edition. So. Okay, that does sound interesting. It is it is good, and it's worth picking up if you. But it has to be the deluxe edition, and it has to be cheap. I'll have a look at that after this. Yeah, maybe. it's good. It's it's just like it's very easy. It's very easy to pick up and play, and it's very much designed for quick, quick playthroughs. I think if you were playing it for hours on end, then you'd probably think oh, it's getting a little bit repetitive. Is now. there a definite ending to it? Oh yeah. After. Yeah, it's got a storyline, but okay. it basically you kind of got the main campaign, and you can just follow that, but once you're on a planet it's like you could spend as long as you really want cleaning up that planet because the idea always is always in the ship you're always in the ship and um yeah it's almost like the controls are, are really nice as well because you're skimming on the surface but then you can kind of uh you can launch and so then you're kind of up in the air and you're like swooping around and stuff do your barrel rolls and stuff and yeah the controls feel really good because when you you do most of the combat when you're skimming along and you can do these kind of bursts sideways and you can do little barrel rolls to dodge bullets and stuff so it feels good oh that's cool okay. yeah and ultimately the the kind of the purpose of it is to prepare these planets for um to defend themselves uh because as you're going through the main campaign they're going to get attacked and if you've kind of built up enough of a defense on them then they can ward and ward them off but then you'll get a warning if they they're getting their ass kicked, and, and then you have you're to go back there and kind of. <clears throat> no, that does sound quite cool. Up. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, like it's that. quite nicely done. Um, and the last one you've mentioned on there to lead into the thing was uh, Link's Awakening. Yes, because that cat. Maybe we should bring her up onto the camera. Come in. Come here, little. Oh sausage. yeah. Sausage. There she is. Yes. Oh, isn't she beautiful? We make so her watch warm. a lot of horror films. All of her hair fell off. <laughs> oh, she's a rider. She's gonna. Shoot she's, gonna she's, she's gone. She's gone. She's gone. That's Bukowski. That's Bukowski. She's so warm. Yeah, she's always really. She's always hot. All the chicks love her. Wow. Boys um, love her. Chicks, boys. I think she's a lesbian. So he's got the les the le please Sphinx. Sphinx. Yeah. The lesbian Sphinx. What's a Siamese? I, What's that? Is that Siamese different? are the ones. Uh, well, yes, that's from Aristocrat. What, what's the? You know the. Isn't it? No, hundred one Dalmatians. Oh. Okay. I think I don't know much about Disney. I think that was right. Okay. She's just jumping from left to left now. Um, yeah, so Link's Awakening, yes, finished that, mm -hmm. and it's a good game. 
uh, except those technical issues. Um, Which is still not patched. Like I don't know, because I haven't played it for a couple of weeks now. But um, it's literally just chewing my guests to death. Um, and I, I liked it, but it did strike me that it's a game, obviously, which is very well loved because mm. people played it on the Game Boy Game Boy Color. Actually, I think it was it. I think I played that the original Game Boy. I think it. Yeah, I think there was a color version with an extra dungeon. Right. Which is obviously in this version. Not that he's a fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can tell that it is a game um, from another generation. I mean, they have upgraded certain things. I hear. But it is quite stiff, like in terms of its design. It's quite Leslie Nielsen. It is a bit, yeah, quite rigid, if you like. Uh, and yeah, and even in its controls and stuff, um, it, it can be, it can feel quite graph papery. Well, oh, I know what you mean. Like yes. when you, I mean, I know it's not really a fair comparison, but like if you look at like Breath of the Wild, where it's all to do with like physics and stuff like that and mess and breaking the game type physics those sorts of things freedom of movement yeah. Sort of, yeah and then you play something like that which is so much a blast from zelda's past which is very rigid it's like it made me think about like what it's it's for someone who played it at the time it must be amazing to see that come alive and it yeah. must almost feel like okay this is what i kind of imagined in my mind when i first played it um, Whereas, because I never played it originally, I've only got this to go on, and yeah. so perhaps it, I wasn't as bowled over by it as someone who played it the yeah. first time around, if you see what I mean. So it, it is a good game, but clearly bound to old mechanics, if you see, if you see what I mean. And um, I think it does a pretty good job of like embracing the old whilst also embracing the new. Yeah. Pretty good. Uh, but it must be a difficult balance to hit as a developer to um, honour what what the kind of original fans wanted but also especially with something as revered as Zelda exactly um, has it or, done well I'm assuming it's oh done yeah, well it's done it ridiculously well I think yeah so I, I thought um, it would it'd be interesting to have a discussion about uh, about kind of remasters and bringing back old games or even returning to old games for the first time you know yeah now obviously you know we'll get a chance to play gabriel knight 3 for the first time later <laughs> game um the, the one the one that leaves to mind for me is um wonder boy and monster land yeah is that the right monster type? world land Right, it's one about the dragon's trap. Oh, that one, yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah. One over there, so because I played them one after the other. So, got that for seventy quid. So that's the first one. On release day. Um, that's the first one. That's... So what I liked about that Come was on. I've never. Everyone loves. Uh, the only Wonderboy game I've played is one. I think if we've only got a cartoon on the Mega Drive. Was was the Wonderboy and what is it? Wonder Boy Monster World, whatever it is on yeah. the on the Mega Drive, and the one that's a really cool RPG. So I was playing that um, years ago, and that's my only interaction with the Wonder Boy, Monster Boy, whatever they are games. And when I got that, I loved that you could flick between that kind of really nice mm -hmm. um, sort of uh, watercolour new visual and then go back to the original Master System 8-bit yeah. style. Um, and it was cool to me, it, but it showed just... Uh, Lizard Cube, isn't it, the company that does it? The way that they sort of... Even when you're playing it in the new, with the new visuals and the new music, you can... The gameplay is locked to the hit to the past. Like yeah. you can really feel like this is enough. But because it was so strong, it was fine. And I'm guessing that's what you got with Zelda's yes, Link's like, Awakening because it was totally fine. Like, I thought, yeah, I can feel this is very much like playing an eight sixteen bit game because of the sort of design choices. But it's so good that you can see now it is still relatively timeless. Yes. Then I played the next Monster Boy game after that, and you're yeah. like, okay, this feels just much better because it's just got all the modern sensibilities in it. Mm. And, and the modern sort of design choices. So that, for me, was the first thing that popped to mind when I think of playing a classic game for the first time. Yes, uh, and th because one of the issues with Link's Awakening, I found, was that some of the logic to the puzzles and stuff, like navigation, was just ridiculous. Like, some of the chain, like, the item chains that you're meant to put together, they just make no sense. So it's like, 
why am I bringing this Fisher to a librarian and stuff like that? It's like, and that that stuff is like, I remember being excited by being befuddled in old games at the time because I didn't really have time wasn't an issue so I could just like it was exciting just to explore this world and then oh I've done it now four years four hours on so. yeah yeah so and it, yeah I found the same with the, the dragon's trap like because sometimes you you hit up you hit a point and it's like what yeah what what am I meant to do next exactly it just yeah. doesn't feel it, it didn't have those modern sensibilities uh the modern design kind of thing yeah. which isn't hand holding it's just fluid I would yeah call it. yeah yeah um, and the whole Zelda thing for me, uh, the only Zelda game I've ever played apart from Link's Awakening on a Game Boy years ago was um, uh, the Ocarina of Time, which has not held up well. Um, no, it has not. Played, I remember playing that um, in like the late 90s. And, okay. <clears throat> and nothing else. So when all these Zelda games come out now, I, I, my, my history with Zelda has been really weird because... I was really excited about Breath of the Wild, mm. but then when I got it, I just come off the back of spending like 200 hours on The Witcher 3, <laughs> and to go straight into another rich open world game, I just thought, I'm not in the mood for this. Mm. And it com I just I ruined it for myself, basically, by just diving into it. So I've got no real nostalgia for the Zelda games yeah. at all. So it is weird to see them coming out. and Which, yeah, which is why... And younger people will have no nostalgia for old Zelda games, they won't have seen the transition between like the original Zelda on the NES to Link to the Past and then to Ocarina where there's those massive yeah. leaps. So it's irrelevant really. So younger people just want to play a good game. So you're never <laughs> going to say to a, a young person, oh yeah, we'll start from the start, start with the original Zelda because why would you? Because it'd be unplayable to them <laughs> yeah. and it wouldn't be exciting at all. You'd probably start them off on like Breath of the Wild yeah. which is much more accessible uh, and just better and then and perhaps work backwards I think that's probably the answer if yeah. you really want to kind of learn <coughs> about the history of video games you don't start at the start you work backwards you you look at what it's become say you yeah. know you'd play like something like, they can get into yeah looks like this more because successful why, you, you're not going to go back to like Super Mario Kart on the snares you're not going to straight into that thinking no. that's representative of what Mario Kart is you play the latest best one and then maybe work backwards to see where it's come from just out of interest you know yeah. oh daddy daddy well, I want to know more about open world games oh okay let me get the Amiga let me pop on Liberation 2 Captain <laughs> <laughs> it's just you wouldn't do it would you yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to know about open world games alright come on let's play Midwinter on the A1200 no, well, hang on. after we've played Damocles <laughs> <laughs> yeah you just these things are not you just yeah, yeah. it is just elitism with um, just saying oh, no, the, the old ones are the best because they, they're demonstrably not like they, yeah. they were good of of their time, but now. But uh, I think you touched on an important point with the the timelessness of the gameplay itself. I mean, with Dragon's Trap um, and Link's Awakening, because the core game is basically a good game. Yeah. Like, it's still a good game. Yeah. Now and so that that will never be lost, uh, and I think it's to do with the timelessness of the game, uh, gameplay, and I, I think something like. Uh, the Monkey Island um, remasters are perfect examples of that because the gameplay is timeless. You can't really... I mean, it's all about the writing, so it's not like... Mm. It's like, other than... I mean, they had the basic uh, kind of mechanics of, like, look at and uh, pick up and stuff like that. They kind of got it down by then because... Regret with. Yeah. They'd... they'd with Because uh, with earlier games... Um, you know, like Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade and stuff, it was a little bit clunky to play, but they, they kind of perfected it by then, LucasArts or Lucasfilm as they were. And, um, yeah, and so really there aren't that many improvements you can make to the kind of, uh, the the overlay or whatever, so they're still good. And, of course, the, the writing's so good. That, yes. Um, that it's like, okay, and on top of that, You've got this new art style and voices, which might not be for everyone. I liked them, but and of course you can just press a button and you're instantly back. We in 1990. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it still looks good. It's Does still anyone of note voice the characters? Or I, I, I remember that Chris Barry did the CD version of Sam the Sorcerer. Naturally. I don't think so. The, I mean, the guy who does Guybrush Threepwood, he did it for 
I guess he did it first for Curse. Well, that was the third one. On yeah, the, and I think where everything was really thin. Yeah, it was a, yeah. a strange art style. Yeah. But I suppose the but the remasters of one and two are kind of a bit more in line with that. But it does look really tasty. Mm. But yeah, and I think it's because the because of the timeless gameplay. You know, you, if you went back and took something like, um, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of like a classic game, which is a little bit clunky now, Ocarina of Time, say. <laughs> yeah. Like you could remaster it, but I think in, without making upgrades to the core gameplay experience, yeah, it's going to be a real struggle, uh, and it, I'm not sure how much fun it's going to be like to have those limitations in place. Now that you've played a 3D Zelda like Breath of the Wild, are you, are you really going to want to just not be able to climb over a fence and stuff like that? It's just going to be irritating, I think. <laughs> yeah, I suppose what you, what you've got uh, Breath of the Wild is its own sort of beast. And and then you've got the Link's Awakening, which is thrown back to that sort of grid-based movement yeah. strategy adventure thing. Just having a, a 3D game slightly dated it would be like if they kind of I suppose it would be different with Mario 64 because that was that has that is still fun to play yeah because yeah, because of the sense of movement it is yeah. still fun yeah uh, but then even then you probably if they remastered it you probably think oh, these levels are a bit empty yeah like they'd have to put it pack more into it and then do you lose that essential gameplay experience you know at the time I mean yeah. Oh, I or would you just think with, to yourself, I'd rather be playing Odyssey? Oh yeah, with, with Odyssey is kind of like an a, a better iterative version of Mario sixty four. Yes. In the same way that, like you said, the Mario Kart games are. Yeah. So there's no point in remaking it, really. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I suppose at a push, I mean, something like Mario, uh, Mario Galaxy is different enough that you could probably remaster that, but they have remastered it only in China. Um, oh, I guess that. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> well, they released Not it on Japan. the. Japan. No, it's the it's because it's the shield, isn't it? Because over there they don't have the switch; they have some sort of N N Nvidia shield type thing. Oh, right, okay. Because Nvidia did the chips for um, the switch, they have a deal with them. So in China they don't have the switch; they have this the Nvidia shield. So they've released uh, remasters. I think Twilight Princess and Mario Galaxy, but just not over here. Fair enough. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the answer is other than because as time goes on, it's going to be harder to convince new generations of the importance of all the, the games. Mold, uh, yeah, mold breaking games. So I think the only way is to really, if you've got an interest in the history of video games, is to work backwards, mm -hmm. love something, work back through the history of it. To, yeah. its to its beginnings, to the progenitors, if you like. <laughs> I was thinking recently about. Um, oh, I made a note on the of Deus Ex because yeah. recently played Mankind Divided for the second time and enjoyed it more the second time because my expectations were lowered. <laughs> uh, th and I was thinking about putting them in order in my head because I remember playing the first one and really loving it. But that is a game that is extremely of its time. Mm. now and I remember being blown away by it on the PC back in 2000 and then playing it now um, <clears throat> thinking this is cool but I prefer the more modern ones just because they're more accessible yeah they, they make more sense but then like if because I've always I say I really love the Deus Ex series I like two of the games in it of the four and if I was to show someone what I show them Mankind Divided which is the newest, or Human Revolution, which is probably the best. Mm. So, but then it's 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 only the previous generation, isn't it? It's not going back so far that yeah. If you know they need to pick up an old console to use it, so. But you wouldn't if if you were if you were talking to someone who'd never played a Deus Ex game before. Mm -hmm. you, what you wouldn't do is say go and play the original. No. Through GOG or whatever. <sighs> yeah. You'd be like, okay, pl you play Human Revolution. Because and then if you like it then if you like it then maybe play Mankind Divided and if you really like that skip so Invisible War which isn't backwards compatible because I remember playing Invisible War and thinking oh it's very different to the first one but it's cool it's on console and I'm not using mouse and keyboard which is fine and it, it was just more action packed and yeah. it seemed a bit more uh, newcomer friendly mm. and I remember it getting really slaughtered 
and I and I've always thought I, I don't think I minded it that much. So I wanted to play it again, mm. bought it, chucked it on the 360. Not that was compatible. I mean, I've got an original Xbox there, but it's it's not in my bedroom beneath a 40 inch screen, is it? So I can lie in bed and play it. So a resolution on a 40 inch screen. <laughs> I'll crack on Morrowind in a minute. Uh, the loading times in Morrowind will be sung about for decades to come. Uh, yeah, so Great song. Have you, when was the, what would you say is for you a classic game you've only played recently? Well, apart from Link's Awakening? Yeah. Um, hmm. Classic game I've only played with. Nah. I mean, Bastion is often regarded as a classic, and I mean, it is quite old now. Probably. Is it really? Well, I mean, it must be 2010, 2011? That's like eight years. It's a long time in gaming terms. But I remember, because I remember it coming out and it was really a, kind of the first wave of the kind of new indie revolution in gaming. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and I remember being hyped up so much. Much in the, Braid was another one from that time, mm. which I just never got into either. No, no. And, um, but yeah, and it, it was, it's like... I don't know, yeah, I can't see what people saw at the time, and I think that might be a clue as to... The, as to, the non-timelessness. Yeah, of. because we, the further you get away from when these games, these seminal games came out, the further away you are from the context in which they came out. So it's very hard to... Uh, because it's one thing to be able to look back at something and have something old like the original legend of zelda play yeah. it now and you'd just look at the mechanics of it you look at um you look at how what it's like to play today but what's difficult is to put your mind into the kind of social um and cultural context of the time in which it was released yeah. so because you're always going to lose that impact um over time you can't put yourself back in that place so no matter what we do, we can't convince people that, like, oh, this is, you, like, however much you say this is a really important game, Ocarina of Time, or whatever, at the end of the day, if they don't enjoy playing it, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah. You can kind of recognise that. Um, but it, it's still do you not necessarily good. With Ocarina of Time, I always remember the, the thing people talk about is that moment when you come, you come out into, is it Hyrule Fields yeah. for the first time on the horse? You show someone who's 12 that now, and they'd just be... <laughs> <laughs> What's it? They'd be like, oh, it's a bit muddy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I oh, maybe, maybe if I, maybe. <laughs> Let's just quit my eyes. Put more of your glasses, maybe. Have you got a smaller TV than 65 inches? <laughs> Have you been smearing goose fat on the screen again? Oh, my face. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's not. I'm looking thing. at you, two up two seeds of evil. <laughs> oh, let's pop on the N64 then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is <laughs> someone being smoking fags in this place? <laughs> someone vaping in front of me. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's not good. Yeah, so it's tricky. So, yeah, I, I guess it's not really. Well, it's not really for new generations to. Uh, no, I, I think e e the seminal games. It's it's hard because it, so much. It relies on so much, doesn't it, a seminal game? Because if it's truly seminal, it'll have an offshoot subgenre of its own, really. Or you yeah. know, it'll 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 completely change the way in a certain genre of games is sort of seen. And well, exactly, because you think about like Metroid, mm. somehow we've basically created a whole subgenre of yeah. gaming. Now, if if you, if you were going to introduce someone to a Metroidvania, you don't say go to Metroid, but you respect the fact that you Metroid... say go to Shadow Complex. <laughs> yeah. Or, or in the blind forest, and but but that doesn't mean that that doesn't uh, diminish the impact or the importance of Metroid, and so that um, legacy has to be respected, and it and Metroid as a game deserves to be uh, deserves to endure, but just not necessarily played that much. <laughs> Do you think? Well, I'm just a bit more in here that. A game having a legacy which is to be respected. Yes. And in this hand, admitting that, uh, you know, judged on modern standards, mm. it's probably not the best in the genre. It was just amazing for its time, mm -hmm. but it's not really something that's 
needs to be played a lot. Sounds rational. Go do on. you think some people have trouble separating this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think they might do. <laughs> cool. Um, game of the week? Uh, well... The, 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 um, the game of the, uh, if I may... Well, I mean, I like Starlink a lot. You did seem to like Starlink. To the point that um, I did think... Um, <clears throat> I, I am intrigued by it. And... Yeah. It's it's a from fun, what you said. It's a lot of fun. Um, I think uh, oh yeah, there was one other point I want to make just about on the Ubisoft thing because obviously Ubisoft games are all Ubisoft open the world same. games, all the same, and they've basically got the same mechanics. So the way I look at it is, does the subject matter and the kind of world they created fit their particular mold? And that to me is basically what makes or breaks a Ubisoft game. So like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, tedious doesn't work in that um in that mold at all that's all from brian ubisoft <laughs> whereas something like starlink which is deliberately kind of like just uh feels standalone yeah busy working and, and like it's like the busy work is kind of nice and simple it's not bogged down by too much uh, like tedious lore and stuff it's yeah it works so that's so you're going to go with Starlink. Yeah, I'll go with Starlink. Um, so Starlink Battle for Atlas Deluxe Edition. Deluxe Edition. Uh, I think for me... Do not get the standard. For me, I think the game that would be Valfaris, because I enjoyed being surprised by how like basic and yet fun and gripping it was. Yeah. And the soundtrack is cool. I'm not a fan of metal music at all, but I do like it when games like Brutal Legend, Double Kick Heroes, and so on, use metal as a tongue-in-cheek kind of, you know, like, we know it's kind of ridiculous and over the top, but let's use all the awesome atmospherics, let's use, like, the really cool booming guitarist and the kind of overarching doomy sense and just make a fun game. So, that's it, really. Yeah, I'm going to be playing that. Good. Are you going to go? Yeah, I'll see you later. <laughs>